All righty, bow hunters, welcome back to another episode. I'm sitting here, I'm actually very honored to have this conversation with you, Ross. Sitting here with Ross Amara. Ross has just recently published the book Wild Meat, which has just hit number one top selling wild game cookbook on Amazon. Um, you've done some incredible things in your past in general, but we're going to kind of really delve into that. I think it's just it's super cool to see uh, an Australian without probably a big marketing team or anything like that put out some great content. And because the content's so great, it's beating all the big dogs from America, beating all the big dogs from over the world um, and really just outselling everyone. I think that's just so cool to see, mate. So first of all, welcome to the show, but also congratulations on that. Uh, thanks, mate. That's excellent. Cheers. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, to kind of give a bit more of a background in regards to, I kind of got into hunting purely for the meat side. Like I, I kind of saw yeah. it as a platform for me to be able to start providing for the family a lot more. Yeah. Um, I started off with the bow because it, there was no real um, no real barrier to entry. You could pick up a bow and you could go hunting as long as you had access. Yeah, yeah. However, the barrier to entry was then learning how to bow hunt, which is why the, the podcast kind of came too, because I had no idea what I was doing out there. I knew no hunters. So I started the podcast to kind of get to interview specialists within the area, or specialists yeah. within hunting and bow hunting in particular, and, and kind of give some get some cool tips for myself, but also share it along the way. Um, yeah. And one thing that's kind of been very almost prevalent to me throughout the journey of this has been that a lot of people, they like to just do maybe a steak or something like that. They love the back straps, that's for sure. But outside of that, there's just not a real understanding of the creativity you can do to make this deer meat in particular just tastes absolutely incredible i mean really all wild game meat tastes absolutely incredible yeah yeah look um well uh speaking about hunting um myself i was i wasn't born into hunting myself um probably what inspired me to start off was my godfather uh as a young kid he used to always be one of the original like duck shooters and mm. um people like that in wa that used to get out and shoot a fair bit um but myself i kind of got there just from my I suppose kind of like my journey from cooking uh yep. I was one of those chefs that always stripped stuff back and stripped stuff back and I kept on going back and back and uh really wanted to get the base source of everything so I actually started hunting before I ended up in Tasmania where it's probably well, probably about the most where I started hunting the most and um also too I started farming I was running pigs I was you know value-adding them selling them in the market um, started having commercial wallaby license where I was actually harvesting wallabies, hares, oh. rabbits for human consumption. Um, and in Tasmania, you can't really bow hunt anyway. No. So that was something that I never really looked at um, as a part of hunting. Um, uh, when I moved over to Victoria, probably the last five years ago, it was probably when myself when I started looking at bow hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, I just started getting to the stage of uh, being a rifle hunter that I was just close so close all the time and and um just found that i wanted to put that extra step in so to speak and, definitely yeah and, and you know it's like what is it most people say you know where the rifle hunters hunt finishes the bow hunter starts you know Indeed. it's um yeah yeah and so i started picking that myself so i mean myself i've only been bunny hunt, bow hunting now for oh, a few years yeah um which was pretty good I, well i mean when i picked it up i was very lucky i spoke to a few people got some great tips bought a bow second hand one and within two months i shot a deer how amazing and i turned around and i was just like what's all this you know what's all this hype about <laughs> um and to put more clarification on that since that i've shot one hair and one other deer and that's it so, yeah, wow. it, just... so it just goes to show that you know uh, mind you, I did have a bit of a break in between it all. Uh, yep. I hurt my shoulder a bit, mm. and then I just uh, restructured it, um, dropped the poundage of the bow, picked it back up, and yeah, no, so I've been hunting hunting with it ever since, really. And tell us about your little encounter over the weekend. I think that's a, a good way to start the, <laughs> start the podcast. <laughs> well, it's that weekend. It was that, yeah, it was yesterday. Um, I uh, have been getting pretty stoked for the rut this year. Uh, there's a good property that I get on that has a lot of fallow, mm -hmm. so I hunt hunt there every rut and um i do use a bit of a rifle at the beginning because before the rut i always like to get a fellow stag when they're at their fattest and nice you know with all that con yep. content so i made sure i got myself one of those and as soon as i get that that's it gun goes away bow comes out mm -hmm. and then i hit it with the bow bow which i've got has been shooting really well it's really well tuned it was going great um but like most things I, i'm one of those people i, I kind of 
have my gear and, and I tend to use it. So I hunt a lot of tree, tea tree, scrubland, yeah. bush areas, and I've been busting through all these areas. And um, uh, yesterday, got into an area, there was a stag croaking. I heard him, he wasn't showing his head, and then um, a malform, a uh, little spike he pulled out, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to get rid of you. And mm-hmm. um, he was only about 40 away. He was really nice broadside, just had, you know, great wind, everything, sat there, just ranged him up, got the bow up, pulled it back. And as I pulled it back, I noticed my peep was a bit to the right. And it was like like it spun, and I was like, "That's weird." And I thought, "That's that shouldn't be like that." And I was, you know, just held it drawn. I was looking, and I was going, "This isn't working." That and I said, "I'm, I'm going to pull down." So I started to pull down, and then as soon as I got past um past that certain edge, it just went bang, and um oh my god went and uh, yeah, so straight away I don't don't know what went and where and, and whatever, but I do know that my left eye got smashed. Yeah. Um, top and bottom of the actual uh, eyelid. I was pretty lucky to not actually be, say, like about four mil up and I would have hit my eye. Actual eyeball, so, yeah. Yeah, so at the moment I've got a big swollen eye and nice little shiner coming on. But um, <laughs> So it was the I, string that hit you, though? Yeah, it was the string. The yeah. string or either the um, peep, I reckon. I'm not too sure. But yeah. um, uh, as soon as I was off that, I was talking to uh, Brad Murphy on the phone uh-huh. <laughs> and I told him what happened. He said, yeah, he said, your string would have, you probably would have cut a couple small strings and then that's mm. what would have twisted it. Uh. And so, you know, thinking about it afterwards, I might've been lucky enough to actually shoot it and would have been probably safer than trying to let it down because letting it down, you get off the risers and then back on the poundage. I look, I, yes. I don't know. Yeah, yeah wow. I don't know, but it was just one of those accidents. And I mean, you know, I'm looking at it now, I'm, lucky that i didn't hurt myself mm. but you know unlucky but, that it happened as well it's funny we talk about the boogeyman being scary i think that's what nightmares are made of right <laughs> snapping you snapping your bow when you're out hunting that's the worst thing <laughs> yeah 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 i mean it's uh, look uh, thank god i mean i only shoot at 60 pound anyway yeah but still even that 60 pound in the face is not anything to laugh enough to, exactly <laughs> i haven't felt like this since i was in my 20s and got punched in the face if you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah yeah so it's a, so it's a bit um it's a bit unnerving too uh, i mean i did go back to the car i kind of had a look at it and just went oh yeah i first i thought i'd split the actual eye mm-hmm. just the way it felt and i thought geez i split it and I kind of went to touch it and I went, oh, don't touch it because, you know, you're out in the bush. That, so, it, yeah. so I got back to the car, looked at it, um, had a look and saw that it was just a really nice, good graze and um, put the bow back, slapped on a Band-Aid and just went, I'm going to grab one of my guns and uh, take care of some of these deer. And, and so went back out there. Good stuff. And uh, sure enough, they didn't know you were there anyway. So a little yeah. crack. It sounds like a, a tree breaking or something. So, <laughs> yeah. Mate, that's incredible. So um, to kind of go back, your your background is in chefing, correct? Like in, in cooking? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so what what kind of re- led you from being a chef to being a chef that wanted to look at wild game? Oh, look, I suppose uh, even from a young age, I mean, I was lucky enough. My dad was uh, in the forces uh, mm-hmm. and we traveled a lot as kids. So I lived in America South Australia, Canberra, Wagga Wagga, um, before I went back to WA. Yeah. So I'd moved around a bit. They lived in Hong Kong before I was born. Um, so and we also travelled a fair bit as well. Um, so I always had a bit of a, how to say, a little bit of a wider scale of food compared to most kids because we'd, you know, been different places, eating a lot of different food and, and had those parts. Um, and then when I did my apprenticeship, I kind of did it for the four years got a one-way ticket on the last, pretty much the last day I finished and then uh, went to Europe for five years. Um, oh, wow. Went over there and I was going to go to the Australian, you know, traveling and everything. But um, I ended up getting a job in one of London's better restaurants at the time that was next door to the youth hostel. And I got caught up in the London trap of working kitchens in W1 for five years. Yeah. Uh, where I first started working with game meat there, um, you know, Red deer, pheasants, partridge, woodcock, snipe, uh, roe deer. So Mm -hmm. every game season, we'd be getting everything in. You know, all our menus had warning, bird contained shot, you know, things like that. So we were dealing with really good, well-harvested game. Um, And then um, moving back to Australia, I've just always kind of 
how to say it, I'm one of those people, I like to be responsible for my own area and for Definitely. what I do. Definitely. And so coming down to it, uh, and I'm one of those people, I love to strip back stuff. So, you know, just the food chain is one of those things. I mean, at one stage, I think until we moved over now, probably for that last 15 years, I've been responsible for all my own meat. Mm, that that's I've eaten. incredible. Either I've been farmed, uh, it's been harvested by me or killed by me. You know, it's like everything about it. So, mm -hmm. um, which my wife, she was a vegetarian for about 17 years. And the main reason why she stopped eating meat was because of the disconnection of it. Definitely. Um, and then when we had twins, a few things happened. She started eating meat again. And the thing that turned it was wild goat shoulder. I had one of those cooking in a beautiful old Stanley wood cooker we had. Yeah. And um, I got up the next day and she'd smashed the whole shoulder during the night when she was breastfeeding. So, <laughs> so I think that kind of turned her over from it. But, um, I mean, just in general, I think it's 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 just that that part of just stripping stuff back. I mean, I made cheese for a while for a couple of years. Um, and even when I raised and, and grew animals like pigs, you know, it's like uh, I used to make my own bacon, charcuterie, sausages, yeah, wow. small goods, mm -hmm. and just sell them at markets. It's it's one of the things I, I, I kind of like dealing with stuff with at the base element and just being responsible for what I'm doing, you know. it's I know it kind of sounds a bit that whole cliche of the hunter-gatherer, you know, this and that, but I mean, it's, it's kind of, that's, you know, I, I do enjoy it, you know, and um, it's interesting you say it's cliche. I almost think it's primitive, right? Like there's a, a very strong yeah, attractant yeah. that draws people into it. Um, it is. And yeah, I, I think more and more, like I, I've only just, like I share a fair bit about it on my own personal socials, but a lot of my sharing of content all goes through my becoming a hunter podcast um, yeah. like platforms. And so the other day I actually just shared some stuff on my recent rut hunt and shared the whole journey, like just bits of the journey and kind of explained different things. And there was so many people, people that like even don't even eat lots of red meat that were reaching out and just going like, I don't eat that much meat, but um, I'm just so fascinated by this. This is so incredible. Like, well done. I didn't know it was this hard, um, but still it looks so attracting to someone who just likes to work hard or someone that just likes to take responsibility, like, responsibility, like you said, for their their meat in general. So yeah, I think, I think there's just an attractive element to it yeah look when i was living in tassie um i used to get people um mind you i used to be a little bit cheeky there uh because there was a few occasions when i'd always have a little bit of how would you say it samba deer for some mm -hmm. yeah or just just around to give out as presents because um that's a species not found in tassie but um yeah. <laughs> uh the one thing which i found was there was there's a massive group of people there that are you know that are either vegetarian based or even vegan based mm -hmm. that live their life with that diet. But then they realize at certain times that they need protein. Yeah. And the one thing which I found with them, the amount of people that I'd come up, like they'd known I'd been away to Victoria and there were a couple of market store holders that come up to me and they said, Oh, do you have any venison? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure. And so, you know, I, and these are guys that are vegetarians or vegans and they don't eat meat, but they just occasionally they'll just go, boom, mm -hmm. I need protein. I'm going to eat stuff that is someone has hunted or gathered or got a direct connection to. So, you know, it's, it's, I find it's just, it's gaining. And, and also to the main people I used to get were buying my stuff were, were housewives that were trying to get, you know, that little bit of a different perspective. You know, I, I think, definitely I think luckily in Australia, we're starting to see the value of what our, you know, spoils are from the hunting, from the wild meat perspective. Mm -hmm. And people are just starting to, you know, eat it, use it better. And also too, they're serving it to friends that, which is then growing and growing. So people are starting to notice it, you know, people can now access wild venison online through a couple of different, you know, distributors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it just seems to be becoming an alternative, which, you know, with the amount of game we've got in Australia, it's a no brainer as far yeah. as I'm concerned, you know, and as someone, I mean, I've, I've been beating this drum for a while, but um, I suppose I'm not really someone that's that active on social media or other platforms. Mm -hmm. um, I'm starting to try to get better at it, but um, yeah, I, I'm kind of, yeah, a, a little bit more, um, you know, old school kind of like I mean, running. You're, you're also taking the public eye, right? Like you, you jumped on SBS just recently and, and talked all about cooking wild game. So like you're kind of yeah. hitting a very different market, but hitting masses of them still without having to do the social media thing. So that's, that's also very impressive. Yeah. Well, the lucky thing is, is um, 
Uh, I've actually got two more episodes coming up on there. One will be coming out um, in um, April and one in May, and I'll be doing venison in one of them and hair in the other one. So That's incredible. Yeah, so, so that that was all from what I used to do when, when I was lucky enough to be involved in the uh, Gourmet Farmers series on SPS. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was involved in that, um, they actually did filmed me getting my harvester's license, filmed us shooting kangaroos, uh, ducks, Cape Barren geese, um, deer. So there was always quite a few things because – that whole show was about food, homesteading, and you know, putting everything together from you know the field to plate, mm. and um, so so there was a lot of stuff which I did in that um, yeah in regards to that. So having doing that before on national television, and um, the funny thing was, in, in the whole time we did that, uh, the only thing that we ever got called back or got harassed on was one of our friends breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and besides that so every time i had a gun and i shot something or every time something like that no one i mean i didn't get any hate mail i didn't get any you know sneeringness or you know nothing came back and the only thing that did was one of our friends was breastfeeding at the table and people complained about it isn't that ridiculous <laughs> they gotta to, got to complain about something don't they yeah yeah it's true, it's true. <laughs> yeah. oh mate yeah that, that's absolutely that it just it actually doesn't uh, surprise me that much, which is unfortunate that that's a part of the world now. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah. it really is a bit sucky, but at the same time, I think it's cool because there's obviously that, that big calling for people who are wanting, who are wanting to do that. Like I think during COVID in particular, sort of mass exodus of the cities yeah. or people who have joint homing, joint housing, where they've got a house out in the, the sticks a little bit more and then a house in the city or a unit in the city that they come to when they have to for work and then they stay out when they can, um, especially with being able to work from online for so many people now, having the ability to just have your own little five-acre farm and live pretty much from the land, that's just um, that's next level and I think where a lot of people actually really want to be. Yeah, look, the sustainability of being able to just control, you know, everything about it, I mean, I, I could never I could never do that fully because I'm such a bad gardener. And um, <laughs> same as um, I'm good on the land, but I'm not good with a fishing rod, you know. So I yeah. used to dive a lot and I used to surf a lot. And um, so I'm always good at going down and grabbing things, but not that crash with a rod or, or <laughs> put, put me in the garden and I might be able to grow potatoes and garlic and that's about it. Mate, yeah, you and me both. The the yeah. possums are the killer here for me. I've grown <laughs> that many vegetables and lost them to possums. Like I honestly think hundreds of dollars worth of damn possums. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, um, in Tassie, we used to harvest possums. Yeah, I was going to say, um, lucky they're protected. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, they're protected over here, but I was actually, they're pretty tasty. Yeah, um, I've heard. Yeah, you look at, the one thing is, is like quite a few people, I've, I've cooked them over the years for a few different people. And I've said to them, you know, it's like, just think of, you know, a free range chicken. Mm. You know, like that, you know, working meat, that type of thing, and just the flavor of it, you know, and, and, and like, uh, it's like anything. If you actually harvest it right, dress it right, and do it at the right point, you know, the meat's great. Um, and I've made many a curry and told people it was a chicken curry <laughs> until afterwards. So. Which great. is, well, you know, I, I don't like to try to do that, but I find with possum, that's one of the meats you've got to do that just to get it past, you know? Definitely. No, I love doing that to my auntie. She used to always tell me that venison was uh was peasant food and so i always would make it the most delicious dishes and yeah. then get her to eat it and then she'd be like this is venison isn't it i'm like yep and she's like it's yeah. darn tasty you've done a good job i'm like told you it's, yeah. it's not peasant food that's for sure <laughs> that's good that's good yeah what? um what was it when you're going back to the covid um that was quite interesting for me because uh that was wasn't that far after we moved here. We'd probably been here a couple of years but luckily for me i lived on a property that was 1800 hectares so Amazing. I was able to pretty much hunt as much as I wanted because That's it was amazing. in the backyard, mm-hmm. um, which was great. One of the ruts, I think I was completely, you know, um, out there by myself. But um, <laughs> the hard part was this, I actually started the book. This The book project was in 2019. Yeah, wow. And so the book was written by the end of December in 2019. It was meant to be out in 2020. But COVID kind of caught all the photo shoot and everything through it and it put it back um, until, yeah, it was only released this year. And I um, honestly think that might have been a thing that helped to boost a little bit more. Would you agree? Yeah, look, I, I think in some ways it has um, just because everyone's had that time away. And then, you know, like you said, like a lot of people have looked at their food and mm. where they're getting it from. And then a lot of people like, you know, I don't want to be caught in that position again. And also too, it's made people, 
you know, I think, you know, the idea of being an at, or accessing your own meat has yeah. been something that was starting to play on a lot of people. So, you know, and, and a lot of people went back to reading. They went back to, you know, really, how to say, stuff away from the internet and mm-hmm. TV. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I think books are kind of, you know, people are enjoying them again. Yeah. Um, even though the publishing world's changed quite a bit since um, the last couple which I was involved with. But, um, you know, it's it's just good to see, I think, and, you know, just, yeah, people starting to look at stuff a little bit differently. Definitely. Um, and so, I mean, when it comes to changing gears and, and talking actually about cooking and let's talk let's talk mainly about gear to start with but then obviously delve into the other other cuts and like we'll talk about other meat as well other game meat as we go but when it comes to cooking meat what like sorry game meat and venison in particular what are like some of the bare basics that you think people miss that makes it then horrible or a horrible experience for them look i i think with most meat in general um it's the base preparation you know Mm -hmm. Uh, when you harvest something, make sure you bleed it. Yeah. Make sure you skin it. You know. Make sure that you get it into good game bags. Mm-hmm. Make sure you cool it down as quick as possible, and then work from there. You know, if you do those basics at the beginning part of anything, you know where you're getting it in the field. I mean, like you know, sometimes things don't work out great. You might shoot something. It might be down a gully. It might be in somewhere where there's water. You know, yeah. as much as you can get out and try to get it out of that area, you know get the, um, with a lot of the animals like Bovania style animals and also, um, you know, with deer and macropods like wallabies and that, you've got to get the stomach out unless you're actually, you know, they're dressing it. Yeah. So that's one of the things you've got to get those stomachs out because they start bloating, they start gassing up. Mm-hmm. That can also taint. So to me, it's mainly the base part of the preparation here. Good game bag, sharp knife, uh, just really, you know, getting into it straight away. I must admit, I don't really post that many photos of the animals I shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, only out of the things, because um, majority of the times now, uh, I, I hunt every week. So I've yeah. got access where I can hunt every week. Um, and um, so I do shoot a lot of animals and I don't want my feed just to be another dead animal. Definitely. And I think that it yeah. also shows another side that people do get upset about versus if you share yeah. the meat, people don't get upset by that. So yeah. it's the the next side, the other side to hunting that we don't share enough of probably, um, like hunters in general don't share enough of, that could actually do a lot of great things for hunting. Yeah, but um, yeah, it, but going back onto that base part, I just think, you know, you meet preparation, you're transporting, and, and then once you get it through, it's just... I find with venison, you know, just in general, we'll generalize with venison because it's probably the most, you know, common one that we'll get our hands on. Mm -hmm. With venison, I find there's either two ways of cooking it. You either scare the hell out of it, like a lot of people like to, or then you cook it for ages. Myself, I suppose I've eaten quite a bit of meat over the years, and I've gotten to the stage now where I actually cook all my venison steaks past just past medium rare to medium and I let it rest out because mm-hmm. I don't like the fleshiness anymore, but I still yeah, love the okay. flavor and the pinkness. Yeah. Um, and then, but most of the time when I hunt quite a few of the private properties I hunt on, the way that I keep access on them is, is what I'll do is I'll take the animal, bring it back, take out the eye fillets, the back straps, the top side, give them back the 20% of the prime. Mm-hmm. And then I'll be cooking things like, you know, uh, rump, silver side round, um necks next one of my favorite cuts to cook same i absolutely yeah. love it yeah yeah by far yeah. one of my favorites can yeah. i ask you what warrants a good game bag you said a good game bag but what warrants a good game bag you hear people using pillowcases i've got cheesecloth yeah. type style ones yeah. um is it just pretty much anything that has like a little bit of breathability to it yeah look something that you can clean yeah. so you can actually clean it and keep it clean something that breathes and also something that soaks up the blood a bit you know, mm-hmm. on the market, there's probably three which I've used over the years, and and they're all really good. I mean, I don't know if you're supposed to name names or anything. Go like for that. it, yeah, if you want yeah. to, yeah, for sure. Well, I've used the Gallon for years; they were always good. Nowadays, I use Argali and also Caribou Gear. Okay. Um, the Caribou Gear and the Argali are both my go-to's now, yeah. And I reckon they've both got great purposes. Um, the Argali game bags, I actually air dried some venison in that for like two and a half weeks under just a whole haunch 
with the skin on one side, bagged up still, and just hung it in the Agali airbags just up under the um, patio over winter. Hmm. And then they came out awesome. Yeah, like really just sealed it beautiful and everything. Um, and I find the caribou gear game bags, they're good as well. And they're kind of almost semi like the pillowcase ones, but you know, I always use the gallon ones for, for so many years before that. And um, I think quite a few of the other companies have got them now. I mean, friends have had Kuyu ones. I've seen ones from Hunter's Elements, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. a lot of people are getting it out there. Um, but I mean, you know, for years, <laughs> Uh, much to my wife's disgust, I used to use the old fitted bed sheets. Yeah. And of course, that corner would go around the top of the whole carcass because um, I was lucky enough when I was first shooting deer, I was always able to get to it. So I was taking the whole carcass. Definitely. Yeah. And then I'd come back, I'd hang it. Um, I had a cool room. So I'd be able to hang it in the cool room in the farm and, you know, I had all those parts going. Nowadays, I, I don't have those facilities here. Mm-hmm. So everything down, I break down. So, and so. Yeah, so sorry. timing wise, so you're getting the guts out as soon as you can. You bleed like you. What what do you do for bleeding? You taking a, a hole through kind of the throat there, like into the heart, the chest cavity, letting it bleed out through there, or what are you doing for bleeding? Do well, you- it usually depends on where you're shooting and what happens to the animal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to to what you do. But um, when um when I used to always harvest, we used, used to heart stick animals as much as we could. Yeah. But I find you know uh, a lot of deer especially Sam, because they're such a big animal. Um, you can just always take the head off and leave that down. Uh, a lot of the times now with the Samba, you know, especially in winter, I do the gutless method where I'll mm-hmm. actually be quick enough that I can get the meat off in about Definitely. 25 minutes. I really so, like that method. It's great. Yeah. So and, essentially and so just I, to explain that you're leaving the guts in and you're harvesting everything around the animal, taking everything right. off, leaving yeah. the guts in. You can still actually even get into your tenders once you've got your back, back straps off. You can get in through the ribs. Little floaty That's ribs, it, yeah. up the top, just underneath the loin part there where you just go yeah. in and you kind of go like the, the top way through and then you can pull that out and that still doesn't even go through uh, go through the guts. That's um, my favourite method if I'm field dressing. Um, yeah. one, one caveat to that is that I love the heart, so I'll always crack open a few ribs, just knock yeah, them yeah. open and, and grab the heart out as well. Yeah, so I've always got a little hacksaw with me. Mm, um, I so, that. Yeah, and, and, and also too... I harvest on, on what I'll shoot. So, I, you know, one of those people, um, you know, I do shoot for meat a lot, but mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, mate. If a stag walks out, I'll be bean lining them. You know, I love, yeah. I love horns. I love antlers and I'll, I'll, I'll take a trophy anytime if one comes up, Definitely. but it depends on what time I usually, when I hunt is like, I go, all right, I'll finish work, pack up, get out three, four o'clock. I go, all right. If nothing out by 525 i'll shoot what you know what i mean it's like yeah, or, or whatever yeah. um that's you know when i'm rifle hunting with the bow it's usually just walking around you know enjoying the moment um i've got an absolute obsession with chasing samba mm-hmm. so that's why my bow counts so long because i spend so much time trying to chase samba um with the bow um and i haven't uh, i've always been it's one second, task one second off you know yeah, and it's probably yeah. It's, I could list probably about eight different times. And, and I also had one, um, uh, one time where I did have uh, one, of those, one of those moments in hunting, which wasn't great. Mm. Um, and it was a 20 plus inch stag, which I managed to just position myself right. He walked out broadside. He was, you know, uh, 17 meters from me mm-hmm. I, with the bow, just turned, knocked, great arrow went straight up and it just didn't even penetrate. Oh, wow. And just stuck in the top and he just took off. And I just hit straight bone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was straight bone. I think it might've been the equipment I was using at the time. Um, Since then I've changed that particular style of broadhead, which I was using um, after chatting with um, a couple of people that know a hell of a lot more than me. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's the one thing which I'll say about bow hunting, you know, I'm lucky enough to, to know quite a few bow hunters, which I can call on. Definitely. And, um, you know, it's great. I find just having that, that there to go through stuff. Like even when the, you know, this busted in my face, I think I was talking to Brad Murphy probably, you know, a couple minutes afterwards when I was walking back to the car, yeah, you know, amazing. just going through what was going on in my head about, you know, what happened and, you know, and he was just, you know, I find having people like that, that you can actually rely on and just as mentors, cause it's great, you know? A hundred percent. And uh, it, it can keep your, 
your nerves at bay. Maybe that's not the right word, but um, your overwhelm at bay probably is the better way. Cause like when something goes wrong in the bush and you're like, well, what the heck happened? And then you're yeah. doing all these scenarios in your head and you can just quickly bounce off someone who's had plenty of experience and they just say, oh, yeah. no, mate, it's all good. Just do this. Like you, you go back and you'll be fine. Or yeah. In your situation, like, yeah, it's unfortunate. It's the bow, bow snaps, but you, you're good to go. Or bow string snap, but you're good to go. Like, it's just nice to have that someone to, yeah, to reconfirm you're not doing stupid things. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, though, is the one thing that also really got to me was my bow was shooting so well. I was mm. so confident mm -hmm. with it and I was really looking forward to this rut. It's probably the most comfortable I've felt with a bow at any stage. Yeah. And then um, this has gone and happened. It's kind of like it slapped me in the face to say, no, no, no. You, know, you put more time into it, you know? So <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's not as easy yeah. as we want it to be, but it's also no, why no, we no. love it so much, right? Yeah, well, that's that's the whole thing. I mean, you know, it's I find if you don't set challenges or push yourself, mm -hmm. you know, it's you know you end up like the rest of the mentally weak people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, mate, back to the meat side of things. You, yeah, you sorry, mate. No, that's fine. Um, yeah. You you put it in game bag. You've got it home. Yep. I personally like to leave it. I've got a fridge that's a pure meat fridge, pretty much meat and beer fridge. And yep. I will yep. just leave it in that in a plastic bag for a week before okay. I chop or cut it or do anything because I don't have a hanging system at all. Um, and that always just seems to make the meat taste better for me. What's the actual proper process that you should go through for that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, what, what you're doing works. Yeah. So, and, and that's one of the things. If you're doing it and it's working and it's safe, and your meat's not going sour, you're not finding anything wrong with it, well, then that's a good practice. It's the mm -hmm. one thing with food and also cooking is um, one thing you'll notice, even with the stuff that I've written in the book, everything is a base. Yeah. It's a base for people to grab, look at, and then put their own spin on it. Okay, I mean, cool. myself, so what I do is um, same thing again. Depends on the animal. Depends on what I'm doing with it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have been known to take quite a lot of samba that I can actually throw on my shoulder and walk out with. Yeah. So I'm lucky enough where I've got an area where there's a lot of young ones around. Awesome. Um, so with animals like that, you know, I know they're going to eat well straight away and I know mm -hmm. that, you know, not going to need time that. And then, you know, if I'm lucky enough, I get onto a nice big Mongo stag, I'll roll him over. I'll still bring him back, but I've got a beautiful old meat cabinet. Mm. That's the old farm style. It's a mm -hmm. big, massive square one. Uh, I've got four hooks in that I can hang a whole Samba and also at least a fellow or another, another deer in there as well. So that's an and unrefrigerated cabinet, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I do a lot of stuff on refrigerated in the first 24. So mm -hmm. I'll always come back um, even in summer too, yeah, because wow. in summertime, you're normally coming back at nighttime. Yes, I'll throw okay. it straight in there. I just find the natural air and the actual cold for that first snap is brilliant. Um, yeah. Especially in winter, winter, it's great. I mean, winter, you can actually leave stuff out for quite a while um it, when i was in tassie we used to call it the tassie fridge because you just hang it in the shed and you'd forget about it yeah. but here you know um <laughs> in high you... victoria it's probably a little bit warmer but you know like even now at the moment so i came home the other day with the deer i bring it back i throw it in that cabinet um put it up in the game bag leave it for the 24 skin oh, sorry, on or skin off skin on so the way i do skin my on. meat yeah. is so say, say if i'm doing the gutless method yeah um i'll go back legs Mm -hmm. And I'll start with back leg on one side and then I'll go shoulder. Both mm -hmm. those, I'll leave the skin on the outside. Yeah. Then I cut straight along the side. I strip down to open up mm -hmm. and then I strip back behind the back straps. Mm -hmm. I take the full back strap. So that's from the back end up to the scotch, which goes up. And then I take the neck as a flap. I take the brisket as a flap. And then if I'm feeling, you know, I'll, then I'll turn it over and do the other side. Yeah. And then what I'll do is then I'll take the eye fillets. And then if it's like something that I really need, I will take that whole trim where you've got the skirt, the hanger steak, mm -hmm. um, all the parts down through there. But I always tend to cut a brisket, a neck, um, shoulder, back leg, full back strap, and then roll it over to the side and then take the eye fillets. And then, like you said, if you want some offal, I'm not a massive fan of venison liver. I mm -hmm. find it really heavy. I mean, I do Quite love strong. bird livers. Yes, um, and um, I will take the crepinette or the coal fat, which is called yes. Australia. Okay. And yeah. um, heart, and I'll stuff the heart with it and wrap it in that. Um, tongue's another one that I'll take. Yeah, I love it the just tongue. It depends on what it's actually here. Sometimes <laughs> you look at you go, oh, no, I'll leave that tongue there. But, um, yeah, so it's, it just depends on what's going on. And then um, then when I get back, you know, I'll let that sit overnight. And then 
because usually if I've got a mate that's come over to hunt, then we'll attack it the next day. Mm -hmm. Or it depends on what I'm going through or I'll take bits and I'll leave it in the game bag and I'll stick that and I've got a meat fridge like you that that sits out the back. Um, but also too, from my earlier days when I used to have my kitchen, I've got a, a fully chambered, double-sided, stand-up 80 kilo uh, cryovac machine. Yeah, wow. So, you know, so the vacuum sealers, cryovac machines, I'll break it down and then I wet age a lot mm -hmm. of the time because mm -hmm. I find it's just easier, it's compact. So um, wet age, you put it in the cryovac bag, you're letting it sit for how long in the fridge? Uh, I usually find with cryovac, it depends on the animal or what's had on um, because then you watch the bags. The bags will fill up with blood mm -hmm. because it starts resting and, you know, the proteins and the blood comes out. If they start filling up with a lot of blood, if you haven't really bled the animal well, well, then I'll change the bags after two weeks. Okay. Because yep. after the two-week period, so if you've got it there to the two weeks, if you leave it in that bag in its blood, it'll start getting that real irony and that mm -hmm. taste. But mm -hmm. if you change that to the blood, then you can leave that meat. If that's a really well good vacuum seal, that can stay in a refrigerator for at least two months or sometimes wow. even more. If you ref if you put it in the freezer, you'll get 12 months out of a freezer easily mm -hmm. if you don't bust that cryovac seal. And it will not change the quality of the meat whatsoever. That's uh, that's pretty cool. I actually want to touch on cryovacs real quick. If yep. you've got any recommendations on good ones like i've got i've got the basic dometic one from bcf and it just doesn't have the suction power like the vacuum sealer yeah, yeah yeah so i will not get the air out of it and so i'll, I'll yeah. cry back a lot of the mints i do and it will still have air pockets all through it's really frustrating yeah yeah see with that then that's when you can look at all the you know the good freezer bags and and stuff like that there's also now you can actually buy um dry aging bags mm, yeah, yeah i've seen them hey. Yeah, so that you can actually backpack in. Uh, I'm actually waiting to speak to a friend that was going to give those a go. Okay. Um, so I was waiting to find out from them. But look, I mean, look, it, it's kind of like, you know, uh, the way I look at it. So, you know, that machine now, I've had that for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And when I bought that, that was $2,000. Yeah. So which is a lot of people go, it. wow, you're spending two grand on that. That has kept my protein packaged and secure mm -hmm. from a family and there's five of us for like 12 to 13 years. Yeah. Definitely. So if you look at it in the long thing, I mean, I personally think chambered vacuum sealer is the way to go. Mm -hmm. I had a vacuum sealer as such. Yeah. Um, I bought an Orved one, which was one of the earlier base model ones. I think I bought that probably 2005. Yeah. 2005. 2004, so when they didn't really have many in the market. Nowadays, there's heaps of them. You mm -hmm. can see them, you know, in all the electrical stores. Um, a lot of the hunting stores now get them. And if you go online, there's probably about, I mean, I know in Victoria, there's three or four different butcher suppliers yeah, that wow. supply all really good model ones. Look, that's one of the things I think if you want to actually continually do it, I mean, I've got a mincer, I've got a sausage cannon, mm -hmm. and then I've got my cryovac machine. It's, to me, the cryovac machine is as important as my mincer. Definitely. Yeah, no, it's well, 100%. It's more important, yeah. It, it's interesting, like, so last year, uh, it was pretty much 90% of our meat intake, apart from, like, when we went out for meals um, and yep. the odd, like, bits of fish and stuff was all from my hunting. And, mm -hmm. like, I invested in a sausage machine, a sausage tube, like you, like you talked about yeah. before, um, yeah. sausage cannon, yeah. But I already had my own mincer, and it's like, well, that's also the next part. And really, I probably saved anywhere between seven to 10 grand on meat, just last year alone. I'm like, look, that's potentially you could go and spend another two grand on some stuff, some good quality stuff. Like you said, a good quality cryback machine and you actually yeah. last longer because of it. Yeah. Well, look, nowadays, nowadays they've got small bench top models that, mm -hmm. you know, considered a home compact ones for about a thousand bucks. Yeah. Wow. You know, and they're, they're more than enough. I mean, the only thing you're going to be saving is probably when you go into the ones like my size or whatever, it's um, the seal is still the same. It's the time. So mm -hmm. I've got double mm -hmm. bars, so I can put two bags. I can do this. I can do that. But, you know, with the ones that they've got at the moment, you know, the single chamber ones, they're still great and they work really well. And, I mean, there's some of them that are only like thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars um, oh, wow. And if you think about that as an investment, I mean, what would you throw down on a bow and a sight, you know, and a gun? Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like the way I look at it nowadays too is like people, it's like knives, man. Spend money on a knife. Get a mm -hmm. good goddamn knife. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of the knives now, it's like there's – um. You know, people 
like friends that are making great knives in Australia. And, you know, a good knife is, you know, I, I suppose I'm one of those kids. I had my first knife at seven, which I almost cut my thumb off and was taken off me. And uh, I think that's probably why I ended up being a chef because I've always had knives of some sort, pocket knives, flick knives, throwing stars. Like, you know, I've always <laughs> had the fascination with knives. Yeah. But you're right, buy once, cry once, right? Like a knife that keeps its edge is worth worth it, especially when you're out in the field. Um, having oh, look, an yeah, easy I steel mean, to just touch it up with is great. But yeah, yeah. like it's just, it makes it's a game changer. It really is. Yeah, but also too at home, I mean, you know, you can buy a good quality set of butcher's knives, you know, for $30, $40 a knife. Mm. That's plastic handled. Mm -hmm. You can keep clean. You can keep sterilized. Because that, that's the one thing, like working with any base part of, any type of food, you just keep those basic elements of, you know, wash at the end when you finish it. Yeah. And then wash it before you start. Yeah. You know, wash, sanitize, go into it, you know, and you can leave it sitting out the back somewhere, you know, where it's not in the way, it's not crowding in the house or whatever. So you've got your little butcher section, but you do those principles. And then when you're cutting into it, nice sharp knife, keep it going, you know. And then package it. I mean, you know, if you can't get one of the vacuum sealers or a cryovac machine, those good old school freezer bags are great. But when you put the stuff in, tap it down, knock the air out, mm -hmm. then get a good seal on it. So it's all about the seal and keeping the air out of most meat when you're freezing it or keeping it in a fridge. And with game meat, it's – and also most meat as well. So most red meat and also poultry, it's about the blood or the moisture that makes it go off. So if you can keep it up, keep it dry – or rotate it or keep it out of its own moisture, it's the way to go. I yeah. mean, we used to get birds in, in in Europe. I was talking about earlier today with someone. So we used to get pheasants in just breast plucked. And they used to come in cardboard boxes during <laughs> pheasant season. We'd grab the boxes of pheasants. There's no plastic, no nothing in there. We'd stack the boxes eight high in the back of the cool room. And the telltale sign was when you couldn't get to the back of the cool room, that's when we pulled them out and dealt with them, which was usually about two weeks. Yeah, You'd pull them out. The cardboard would be all over them. There'd be green slime. There'd be this, you know, feathers, the whole lot. And then we'd just start ripping into them. And mm -hmm. uh, we never served it with the skin on, of course, because yeah, you, know, yeah. you let it go like that. But then we'd just cut the flesh out, you know, clean it up. Um, and I still to this day could not tell you how beautiful and fresh and tender and great this flesh was you know it was just unique you know having game and you know dressed the right way like we used to get uh, red deer in fully rutted up red stags mm -hmm. and when we used to get it so the horn should come in and sometimes they'd strip down past the whole side of the loin mm -hmm. put the fur back up on the open part and tie it so you'd get this haunch with fur on both sides hmm. just to seal it in and then what we do is we take that all off and of course, it was really rain ruddy stag. We'd throw it in buckets. Um, we'd put red wine in it, juniper berries, bay leaves, garlic, shallot, and just leave it for two weeks in red wine. Yeah. Then pull it out of the wine and you'd actually cook it. And it, you know, would take a lot of that ruddiness and that mm -hmm. real rankiness out of it. I mean, you know, I, I can understand like a lot of people don't eat rutted stags because we're lucky enough, well, it's, it's a bit of a hard one for me as well. It's like we don't have to, by law, take the meat where in other countries you do. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the things in Australia. I, I think that does also make people not use as much as they should do. Definitely. Because yep. they've got the option of just leaving it. But, um, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of the stags, I mean, you know, I'm sure you've shot a real nasty ruddy stag where you just look and you go, geez, there's only backbone and ball sack and that's it, you know. <laughs> there's, there's not much on them, you know. Yeah. No, I, I've always been a bit a big advocate for keeping it no matter what. And I think with that stuff, I usually just start to use for, that's when the slow cooker comes out a lot more, doing a lot more yeah. curries and things like that for the ruddy yeah. ones, especially ruddy yeah. billies and stuff like that. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goats. yeah, I had um, goats at one stage there and, and I used to sit there and I used to watch my billy sit there cocking his leg, pissing on his own face. And I'd be <laughs> like, dude, you know, and, and he'd just be loving it. You know, yeah. that, that was his daily routine. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, getting back onto the, was it, um, what was it you were just talking about? I just lost my train of thought on that last one. Um, maybe the, uh, we were talking about cryback and, and meat side of things. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting thought. 
Well, hopefully you come back to it because I want to actually ask about the golf facts. We kind of skipped over it. So hopefully talking about something else will bring it back up for you. But the golf okay. fat, the, the method of doing that. So golf fat's essentially like, it's kind of like visceral fat in a sense, isn't it? Well, it's the lining of the stomach. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like the, the honeycomb lining of the stomach and that. And so in Europe, when they usually cook with stuff like that, it's always done like, you know, if you're talking the old French way, the old f- fancy thing that have a farce on top of a lamb cutlet, which is something, you know, that's quite lean. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have like the mince on top, bit of spinach. Then they'd wrap it in that, which keeps all the moisture and everything in. And Mm -hmm. also the the really old charcutiers in France use it a lot to keep moisture into their terrines, galatines, uh, pâté en croûts, Mm -hmm. when they're wrapping it and putting inside the pastry. So the actual meat doesn't bleed into the pastry and doesn't actually leach through. So the pastry Mm -hmm. still stays nice and crusty and, You'd be able to cut through and then all the moisture stays in the meat. Yeah, wow. So kind of not like Nan's old dried out meatloaf, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if, you, if you wrap it in that, it kind of, you know, keeps all the moisture in. Um, I find if you get a heart and, um, you know, take all the ventricles out, all the parts, stuff it, wrap it up in that and just throw it over fire in the coals and then slice it and it just keeps it all moist and, and really tasty and beautiful. What do you stuff the heart with? Uh, usually just a mince of whatever else I've got there. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, when you're talking about animals, so most of the main cuts is 20%. So you're looking at 20, 25% of the top steaks, the eye fillet, the back strap, mm. the top side, where all the rest of the stuff isn't. And in Australia, most people um, years ago, well, not even that many years ago, everyone would just mince it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, when you used to go to your butcher, it was either – Chops or mince, this or that. You know, shanks were given away, things like that. But if now, if you go and have a look, you can get, you know, sirloin, porterhouse, scotch, round, flank, Mm -hmm. all these other different steaks, brisket, and all these other cuts, which slowly people are starting to use more and more of the animal, which is really starting to show, uh, especially within people that are home cooking. Mm Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, everyone cooks, everyone eats. And so, so that's the, the whole thing about cooking is, is like to try to put it in, you know, layman terms, it's like someone like myself that does it commercially or, or professionally, I've done it over the years. Once chefs realize they're not the gurus or the rock stars of the world and realize that everyone can do what they're doing and probably just as good because everyone does it every day of their life. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's one of the things with food I find it's, it's so giving that so many people can just communicate and use it and, and enjoy it. And it's, it's just great. It, it really is almost a love language, right? Like to be able yeah. to provide and share for, for people and to have, like, I, I absolutely love having people over and giving them venison for the first time. And they're like, yeah. Oh my God, like just to, 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 just to watch their experience. And some of them are very standoffish and then they have it and they're like, Oh my gosh, give me seconds. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, have you ever had um, any vegetarians trying to taste it just to try? So, actually, very interesting story. Over my rut, um, my cousin and his wife came out, and his wife is Italian, and she's also yes. vegetarian now. She grew up on a dairy farm, and so because of the whole farming process, the yeah, yeah. the whole process of um, yeah, the cars, disconnect, yeah. exactly right. She's like, you know what. I am vegetarian by choice, but I would eat hunted meat. So I actually had some venison mince there. So I gave it to him straight away. And then she was actually the one that was cheering the loudest when I got um, a deer down. She was like, oh my God, yeah, you got one. Like so excited <laughs> for me and stuff because she knew she knew the extent that this was then going to be our meat for the next three to six months. Like she was blown away by that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's, it's great when you, um, you have that part of people where – I, I've had it quite a few times and, and it's kind of weird and I don't know why, but I will tend to get people that really are just curious about it and people mm-hmm. that are just so distant from it as well will approach me about it. And, you know, some of the people that I give venison to or I end up cooking it for or, you know, same with same with other, other animals as well. I just find that it's it's one of those things, I, you know, just try to keep it approachable and just try to keep it, you know, quite simple. And, it's, and, and I find too that, the simpler you do it, the more people go, oh, my God, I would do that with beef or, oh, my mm-hmm. God, I would do that. Like if you're cooking, you know, quail or something, oh, I'd do that with chicken or I'd do this or that. So it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I just find it just has a really good, um, yeah, a really good opening connection. Yeah, I think paper. like simplicity, it really does, like you're so right in the sense of like it, it 
better way to put it, a lot of the way that I cook my meat is the exact way that I would cook my steaks, for instance. Like yep. a little bit of salt, maybe a few herbs, and then that's kind of it. Like it, it yeah, really yeah. does make it re- very simple to eat. And then also like to be able to give it to, I've got young girls and give it to them and see them chow it down. No worries whatsoever. Like it, it really yeah. is quite a beautiful meat. Um, tallow, we're talking about the fat in general. A lot of people <laughs> kind of disregard it. Yeah, disregard it pretty quickly because of the the oiliness, the, um, the leftover yeah, grime yeah. on the teeth. Is there anything that you do with it? Do you render it or anything like that? Look, I, I t- to me, venison fat's kind of like lamb fat. Mm-hmm. Um, I cook with it, but try to not let things sit in it because you get that filminess, that chalkiness, and, and the other parts. I will. Um, the the funny is with my sausage mix, I find that lamb trim is the best binding agent for a fresh sausage with samba, okay. which is kind of kind of bizarre. I find with pork and also beef fat. Unless you do a really, really fine grind mm-hmm. and use meal, where I only use just meat in my sausages. Yeah. So I just use meat and I find I do a bit of a coarser one. I find that binds the best and also has the better flavor to it. Hmm. Um, but venison fat, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that I cook my venison quite a bit, um, which I've done quite a lot for hunters and, and other people. And I've got a couple of people that get a little bit blown away by it, but it's pretty much just salt, pepper, uh, meat. But um, yeah. I'll use cuts like neck or during the rut when I get those really before the rut and I get those really fat fallow deer, mm-hmm. I'll take off the way I cut my leg is I'll open the leg up, take the top side out, take the silver side, the Girolo, the round, and then I'll cut straight across the top and I take the whole rump. Mm. Um, I saw in one of your posts earlier on where you got the tri-tip out and you yeah. did your bits like that. I, I just leave the whole rump. I throw that in my cryvac bag. I just cryvac it. And then what I'll do is I'll pull that out. I'll throw it in a pot of water, bring it up to the boil. And then once it starts boiling, I'll turn it down to simmer and I'll stick a lid on it. And then I'll slowly simmer it for about three, three and a half hours. Mm. until when I can just feel the whole chunk of it just starting to break through and then I'll turn it off, let it set, and then cut the bag, pull the stock out, and I'll keep the stock to, you know, noodle soup or something or whatever later or that and then i'll just hit a heat up either um you know nine times if we have a barbecue it's always on fire i've got a little Mm. griller which i cook over fire and charcoal Um, i light that up and just grill it salt and pepper and just keep on cooking and crisp it up and it comes out like the you know the how to say the asian style of twice cooking where you've got that real crunchy and then it's all soft and sticky and i find when it's a real fatty venison, I find that's great to do it in, hmm. but over fire is the best. But to do it in a pan, man, you just get stuck with that chalk fat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, look, I've heard of people trying to make, I've had friends try to make candles. Um, yeah, I've, look, I haven't found a purpose for it, mate. You know? so maybe. <laughs> um, so it's, a, it's one of those things I just haven't been able to find something for it. No. We're actually just about to move house and the new house has this like almighty barbecue, but I almost don't yeah. want to use it. I want to keep using my Weber because it's got like the buildup from all the years yeah. of cooking and the open flames. And it yeah. just, yeah, using that that open flame just makes such a different taste to it compared to, it yeah, does. like you said, cooking in a pan. It makes a very big difference. Yeah, so I, I do use... um those uh cast iron style griddle pans sometimes mm-hmm. inside but um you know nine times out of ten if, if we're cooking you know chunks of meat so we used to do one of those quite regularly uh, mm-hmm. and back when i was in tassie i used to have a, a an old wood wood um wood stove yeah, one wow. of the old Stanley, you know where you yep. like the side uh-huh. and i'd find i'd just put that on a tray salt and pepper throw it in the wood stove and it'd just crunch up come out throw it in the middle of the table um, I would have made either some uh, corn masa tortillas or something, throw it there, that meat, salad, you know, all the other bits. And then the kids would just sit there and they'd just be like, you know, meat, a little bit of sour cream, cheese, no, yeah. no salad, no nothing. And that's what they're having <laughs> in their tacos. They're, they're kind of, they're kind of little beasts back in that stage. You're, so, you're making my yeah. mouth water, mate. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and so front shoulder. Do yep. you, what do you do with it? Like, I mean, back, back leg, I really find is really quite good for roast steaks. Um, and then you actually silver side before we move on silver sides, what do you kind of tend to do with them? So my silver side, that's, that's the other thing is like, um, 
probably corn venison is one of my favorite breakfasts. Mm-hmm. Um, just corn venison, slice it, just grill it, crisp you, it up. Do you have an injector? Like the meat no, injector? No, no, no. So, so what I do is I take the silver side. Um, so I've got a few magic formulas that I've, I've used over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them's with any curing, yep. 60, 40. So 60 salt, 40 sugar. And mm-hmm. with that sugar would be 30 brown, 10 white or caster. Okay. Yeah. And then I mix that together. I just throw a handful of that in while I cry back it. Then I throw it in the fridge and let it sit. Huh. And then I go back in the next day and I turn it over. Yeah. And it just starts moistening up. Through. Yeah. Wow. And then I just do that over six days. Um, depends on the size. If it's a Samba, it's, you know, eight to 10 days. But if it's yeah. a fellow, it's about six days. And then I just turn that over. And then I pull it out. Um, and then I cook it in um, malt vinegar, juniper, bay leaf. I've got a bay leaf tree, garlic, peppercorns, mm. uh, salt, sugar, just yeah. like grandma used to do. And then, yeah. And then after that, we just leave it in the fridge. And I mean, that cold cut will last without any preservatives or nitrate because I do all my food uh, without any preservatives or additives. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like using binders in um, sausages or or any stuff. When I do make salamis, though, I do use back to firm. Okay. And and if I'm making it for someone else, I use sodium nitrate just to be safe. But um, And then when I get get the corn out, I'll just leave it in the fridge. I mean, we usually eat it within a week. And um, I just fry it and do it with fried eggs. Um, and the other thing which I always go on a golden rule, um, say if you're making sausages or if you're making a terrine or a meatloaf or meatballs or hamburgers, I never go, you know, like a lot of recipes will say 500 grams of mince mm-hmm. to this, to that. I don't, I just mince what I've got, throw it all in a bowl, uh, got some cheap scales off eBay or whatever, the big platform ones, yep. I'll wait on that, tear it, put it back on and I do 1% salt. One uh, percent salt over any fresh minced meat is the perfect amount of salt, unless you're doing. Um, so that's for fresh sausages, for like burgers, for terrine. If you're doing something like an air dried sausage, you mm-hmm. want to go up to about two and a half percent to two percent. Yeah, wow. That's that's the next thing I want to try to do is get some <clears throat> like dries where sausages happening over this winter. I'm excited. Yeah. For that. Um, um, do it in your Weber. You can actually smoke those in your Weber, like slow, like kind of smoke them. It's a um, Weber kettle, is it? Uh, it's no, it's the little uh, Weber Q, like the baby Q one. Yeah, the Weber Q, they're quite still low too. You can yeah. actually probably put a platform off that and do a tray mm-hmm. and just kind of, you know, um, water, tray, stuff, chips down the bottom, really low mm-hmm. smoke. You'd be able to smoke in that as well. Yeah, wow. That's so cool. Um, it's interesting because I've tried doing the pickling before, um, the corning yeah. before with stabbing the, the um yeah. Silver side heaps, and that worked. I just left it for probably, I think it's three days or two days. I just left it in yep. there, um, and that worked without having to buy the injector. But um, the other thing I've done with that is made little pastrami uh, from the yep. from the silver side, and that's absolutely incredible. And use use it almost like a smoking in the in the Weber as well. And that's yeah, that's beyond delicious. Um, yep. So the main on, difference between sorry, pastrami and silver side, yeah, would be the fact that pastrami is smoked. Yes, so a few different spices. Yeah, so I'm essentially using like a, a bark chip in there and yep. using it on a platform and smoking it a little bit differently. Not necessarily a proper smoking, but yeah, slightly different. It gets the smoke ring, but not yep. not to the extent of it being fully smoked. But yeah, it still works out really delicious. Um, yeah. So moving on to the front leg, what, what do you tend to do there? I, I personally, I really like it for either slow cook or I mince a lot of that. That's where a lot of my sausages and mince comes from in general. Um, yep. what, what do you kind of find is best Ooh. for? But look, it's it's kind of weird because, you know, every animal that I've ever had walking or that I've raised or that I've hunted, um, you know, I'd, I'd throw throw the back, back leg over the front shoulder, mm-hmm. go, to a venis- go to venison and it's the other way around. You know, the back leg's got everything. Mm-hmm. The front leg, um, I still, my front legs, I will, I'm like you, uh, I will actually use, you know, the shanks if I'm going to braise them, I'm yeah. going to mince them. Yeah. But then also too, I always take... My, one of my favorite steaks is the flat iron oyster blade or mm. whatever you want to call it. Um, mm. The Americans call it the flat iron or the iron. And then the, you know, English, or we call it oyster blade in mm. the UK, they call it blade. So where you got the scapula, yep. you got the two sides, two of sides. It. Yep. the side that curves like a wave. Mm-hmm. You go in there and you cut down along, take out that whole scallop there. And if you have a look, it's kind of like almost like a, a long teardrop. Teardrop, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it's got a massive piece of sinew through the middle. Mm-hmm. 
and then you straight on the sinew, cut it down, and then take the sinew out, and you've got two, like, flaps, and then you just grill those, slice them straight across, and um, great, beautiful steak. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's it's one of the, the cool kind of barbecue cuts, mm -hmm. but also, too, that's probably one of the cuts that I show people, you know, that that is a cut that you can actually cut out that should be reasonably tender yeah without sitting for long but i mean if you let that sit for a while on the bone like i've got um one off a shoulder which i'll be cooking in two nights time and that's been there for like eight days that's going to be like butter yeah and i find also too with the sandbar because there's you know there's, there's so much bigger the scapula you know you're getting nice thick yeah cuts like that where sometimes the, the little fellow you're like okay i'll <laughs> <laughs> You cut yeah. it up and use it in a stir fry. But so <laughs> I'll always use that. Um, also, too, I do like to whole cook the whole front ends as well. <laughs> okay. So sometimes. It's barbecue like, you know, barbecue yeah. style or? Yeah. So like same thing again, like I've got, um, you know, just over coals or mm -hmm. or I'll actually, you know, start cooking them in the, the ghetto sous vide and then finish them off to color them off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, nine times out of 10, I'm probably mincing them. Yeah. After I take those couple of steaks out, you know, it's, um, I find with my family, with the kids, you know, we go through a lot of venison mints. Yeah, it's the same, right? And it's a, it's a quick, easy meal as well, right? If you've yeah. spent the whole day working, you don't necessarily want to spend hours in the kitchen. You can spend 20 minutes and make a spag bowl or some patties or something like that and be pretty happy and everyone's stoked. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I definitely go with that route. I actually want to – one of the goals – this year is to get a whole deer and turn it into a whole batch of sausages, like just make bulk sausages. I want to try some smoked sausages. I want to try some, like I said, some dries worse and everything like that. And um, that would definitely happen at some point this year. I've got a few friends that are keen on that as well, which is good. Um, yeah. And then Nick, you said that you, you'll often actually cook it as steaks. Is that right? Or you'll always do a roast or a slow cook for the neck? We just lost Ross. Hopefully it comes back. Oh, all righty, we've got you back. Um, yeah. So you were saying with the neck that you actually, yep. were you saying that you do steaks every once in a while with it or you actually just do roasts and slow cooks with it? Uh, look, with the neck, I'll roast, slow cook, um, either braise, but that twice cooking method that I do, mm -hmm. I find with the neck that's like, that's insane, you know, yeah. just cooking that. That's probably one of my favourite ones to do because you've got all the different um you know little interjoining bits mm -hmm. of muscle and and, yep, and the meat and everything, it yeah. just when it starts crisping up it's just all pull apart sticky and and um also slow braising i mean the neck's just such a great cut it really and, is. Uh, you know I, I suppose you know most animals you're talking you know it's like it's a really good thick chunk of meat mm -hmm. you know especially the samba ones like you'll get them they'll be like almost an inch and a half two inches thick that's you know, crazy, a big, isn't it? A big flap like that, you know, so, you know, big dinner plate size. So the double cooking method, I know you mentioned it before, but can we delve a little bit more into the, the plastic yeah. bags that you're using for that? Is yeah. that always the cryvac or is it or is it something else you can use? Yeah, well? no, no. I always use cryvac bags. Um, I use what you say. I don't buy the over-the-top expensive sous vide bags. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a sous vide unit, which I do use occasionally, but I still prefer the ghetto sous vide method i don't know why i just find it i just get a better result and yeah. um and then like you know I'm, after you know living in asia for like three or four years um you know i'm not shy to getting a bit of broth out and some noodles throwing some chili in it and, uh, mm -hmm. you know noodles ramen that type of thing i do love it delicious and yeah. i find that whole compressed venison stock that comes out of that bag you know it's like two meals in one so yes. Yeah, so I, I look I, and I find it's so easy to do, and it's it's same like um, I have never tried it with a Ziploc bag, but I know people that have and said they've had success. Okay. But Ziploc bags I find work well if you're doing any curing as well, mm -hmm. and you don't have access to a cryovac machine. A yep. good Ziploc bag, but just put it in a a plastic container so if it does leach out, it doesn't go all over your fridge because um you'll find that brine or any type of curing liquid is kind of like blood. Once it goes, it goes everywhere. And mm -hmm. the next thing you know, it's all through your fridge. 
Yeah, and I'm laughing because it's happened to me before. <laughs> yeah, look, mate, it's, look, it's it's happened to me. It's and it's happened many times when I've walked into a, uh, one of one of the kitchens at work and I've just said to someone, "Hey, yeah, uh, you might want to move this tray," or you know, it's it's the common occurrence, mate. It's it's just it's one of those things in life. <laughs> um, and then how about like I know you've seen the broth from from that you use, but do you actually ever do bone broths or anything like that with the with the and look, I, I have I have it Venice. I have it work. So one of the dishes we do at work, um, I use Wild Shot Samba, mm. um, which we can actually access through a company. Yeah. Um, and I throw that in. So I'll get two boxes, twenty kilo, and I just get the four quarter shoulders. Mm-hmm. I throw it into a brat pan, which is a large frying pan and has water. Take it up with water, bring it up to the boil, throw it down to simmer, put the lid on, walk away for about six hours, come back when it's all broken and then I just take all the meat out, rip all the flesh off, get rid of the bones and then all the liquid that you're left with is what you'd probably call a fonds blanc, which is a white stock. Okay. So, so like a lot of people, you know, have always think a stock is something that's roasted. That's just a style of stock. You can mm-hmm. actually do the poached or um, in, in France and Europe a lot. They do eat a lot of boiled meat. Um, and it's one of the things as well. Next time you get a shoulder, just slow cook it in water and you'll actually find like, you know, the bits through the scapula and everything. Once you get it to the stage when it's really soft and that, just take it out, slice it, just put a bit of salt on it. Like poached meat's beautiful. Mm, it's really definitely. good, you know. And then you're left with a, a bit of a base stock. Then we take that stock out, let it set, take the skim, whatever, it's on, off the top. And then I'll throw on my base mirepoix, which is your carrots, your veggies. Um, I'll throw that stock back in. And I'll probably put half the amount of that stock of red wine because, you know, wine makes everything taste good. <laughs> that also gives it a lot of cover, color and richness. But um, those two, when you reduce them down together, that's where it creates, you know, a really good base. And then I'll throw tomatoes, take that down, and then I'll throw back in the meat and I take that down. And then once we take that all there, then I'll pull that out and then we package that and then when we get one on order, we take, say, like a spoonful of that, which we add, we have like a, a veg stock that we cook through all service. That's just a basic yeah. stock. We put that veg stock, we throw the meat, we take that out a little bit. And once it's out that, we throw on butter, herbs, salt, pepper. So you've got like so many different stages on this actual piece of mm-hmm. slow cooked meat. So it's kind of, it's really, uh, it's basic, rich and intense. Then we toss it through pasta. But oh, wow. it, it's kind of one of those things. I mean, like a lot of people that come to have that pasta, they say, you know, it's, wow, it's got so much going on, and, but it's, it looks so simple. But they don't realize that it's been probably about 30 hours worth of cooking to get it to that <laughs> stage. But it all starts with a base element of water and meat. Yeah, and then wow. you slowly build on that. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, I think that like that gives a fair, or actually in regards to the offer, what do you actually do? Um, the the Awful. Yeah, what do you do there? So tongue, you like to um, boil tongue, and heart. double cook, or yeah. So tongue, tongue. Most of the time, I, I mean, the only ways I've really eaten tongue has been where you poach it, mm-hmm. and you know you poach your tongue. Uh, I've always done that just in water with a little bit of uh, what they call um, a cartouche, which is just a, a paper lid, mm-hmm. and that's the way I've always done it from when I was taught thirty odd years ago how to cook it. Um, just with herbs, you know, a bit of spice or whatever. Um, I tend to find people that aren't really into eating it. I kind of say to them, just think of corned beef yeah. and then just make sure you put a fair bit of vinegar in the cooking liquid so yeah. it does taste like corned beef. Um, <laughs> and then um, then I'll, you know, cook it and then I love grilling it again or I love just slicing it up. But, um, you know, you can always tell when the tongue's cooked when you can actually peel it. That's yes. a, another way of telltale. Um, one thing with liver, a lot of people, when they cook liver, uh, they'll find that you've got to take that film of skin, that thin bit of skin off it, you know, and that makes a world of difference of liver too. Mm. Um, kidneys, kidneys are good too. Some people, because kidneys have such a distinctive flavour mm-hmm. because of what they're used for in the body. You know, a lot of people have that in their mind and that. If you soak them in milk, it'll make their flavour a lot softer as well. Oh, wow. So if you ever get kidneys, you put them in milk. Um, brains is another one. Um, which I have got a recipe in the book, actually. It's a wallaby brain one, which we have eaten and 
and done, which is kind of hard because most of the time when you're harvesting, you're always going for a brain shot. So um, <laughs> drop it low into the neck to get one to actually eat was always a bit different. What's, um, um, what's the access? Like how do you get the brain out? What's the best way? Oh, for that? just like like most uh, like most animals. If you know, if you cut right at the top base of the spine, mm -hmm. there's that little hole part there. Yeah. And then if you've got that there, either slightly start tapping with a hammer or just go down with the hacksaw on the back, and then you just go just pop the top and comes wow, out. Come straight out. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, so tongue, liver, brains, uh, the crepinet. Uh, I don't really eat the sweet breads off game. I uh, haven't really eaten those. Um, kidneys probably one of my favorite kidney dishes and still now um you know i had english grandparents so i grew up you know with steak and kidney and, and those mm -hmm. parts but i love rabbit kidneys or or you know hair kidneys on toast for breakfast you know and oh, i'll wow. just fry it and garlic a little bit of onion worcester sauce a little bit of you know cream or whatever and just make like a devil kidneys and mm -hmm. um i just i just yeah i love that for like a breakfast food um but um yeah, I, I just, yeah, I suppose with pig offal, um, pig offal, if it's wild pig, I try to stand away from it because, um, mm -hmm. you know, raising pigs for so long, it's the first part of the pig that'll get the worms. Okay, yep. So, you know, if you're in an area that, and the pigs have worms, um, you've, you know, eight times out of 10, the flesh is fine, yep. but it's all in their offal. So I stay well away from that. Um, macropods, I don't really eat the offal or I'll never even feed it to a dog just because of um, their digestive system and also mm -hmm. too, what diseases that they can be susceptible for. Yeah. So, but venison, I find we're lucky in Australia, our venison, you know, it doesn't seem to have many major disease or any diseases besides, um, you know, if they get poisoned with 1080, which is a really shitty thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things. If you ever open up a deer or anything and through its intestinal system, it's blue, just that's walk away from it. Yeah. yeah wow. That's 1080. That's 1080. That was probably one of the only things that I was first taught in my shooters course when I did it on my human consumption harvesters course in Tassie was, you know, how to tell if there was 1080 in the animal or in the area because mm. they did um, baiting for many years and they're only just now getting out of it and not seeing the problems from it. It's, you know, and, um, you know, that's, that's why the, um, the uh, Tassie devils had all those facial tumors and a lot of stuff. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff where they couldn't talk about it because, um, you know, they seem to cause that problem from, you know, poisoning animals go. and then the devil's eating off those animals. So, yeah. Yeah, they still want to go and poison all the deer now in South Australia, right? That's going to be the method. Uh, they're even talking about it here in Victoria. So it's it's mm. very frustrating. Um, and even now, I mean, like, I just, I just can't see how this day and age, how people will go around and waste such a viable resource. 100% agree. You know, and when they're complaining about everything like that, you know, and and that's the whole thing. Like, um, you know, it, it's just the more people that we can get to look at it differently, and yeah, you know, I, I still think we have quite a way to go. You know, in Europe and mm -hmm. America, other places, you know, games looked upon as game, you know, and yeah. game seasons, game season, and I think for us, because we haven't had a distinctive season, we don't have that relationship with it. No, so it, it's a that's bit hard to be. Yeah, and because we can get it all the time as yeah. well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Um, in regards to other species within Australia, um, pest species or game species that you can that you hunt and um, love to hunt, what are some of your favourites? Look, um, goats. Mm -hmm. I just love eating goat. Goat's yeah. pretty good. Definitely. I love small game. Um, probably... The other one I get really excited is I love birds. Game birds are one of my favourites. Um, been really pissed off this year with the duck season um, mm. in Victoria and also the quail season. The quail season probably a little bit more. The duck season I started going away from because um, just because of how political and how much bullshit's involved in it. And, mm. and I've always hunted private properties and not wetlands just because, mm -hmm. one, I've had access, and, two, I, I just find – you know, going to a wetland that's like kind of going to a public golf course on a on a long weekend. Yeah. You know, everyone's going to be fucking be there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I was kind of happy just to leave that by the wayside and then do my quail season for a few months. But it, this year as well, they even shut you know cut that back here in Victoria, which I don't understand why the reasoning behind that, um, which is pretty sad. But um, I'll probably get out in the first day of the season um, and at least do that because I, I love game birds. So I'll chase that down. I'm hoping to get um, uh, 
well, I want to get my bow fixed up so I can get that sort of go chase some goats and pigs up and uh, a place up in Broken Hill. Yeah. I've got access to. Um, and um, yeah, I, I suppose because of where I live, I mean, deer is just my, it's, my, it's on my doorstep. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. No, I, can, I can walk across the road and harvest deer. So that's incredible. Yeah. So it's pretty lucky. Something that I've actually had not a lot of, but really enjoyed it every time I've had is hair. Um, it was one of the first animals I kind of harvested from my yep. my block that I've got access to. And like, it was just because it's obviously quite a, a red meat. It's actually so delicious and very different mm-hmm. to what you, what your um, rabbit is. But yeah, I was actually very blown away with how good the hair was. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like you look at all the mythical creatures, the jackalope, mm. you know, the hare with the antlers. Mm-hmm. And um, in a place that I used to hunt with Tassie too, there was one spot in this area, I'd always see a hare. And every time I see a hare, a stag would be not far behind. It was kind of like huh. this weird. And then there also too, because the meat's just so different. Um, I, I Look, I, I've always really enjoyed hair. I used it a lot in Europe. And um, I'll, I've actually blown hunts over going for a hair instead of deer. Um, yeah. You know, just it just depends on, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit weird like that. I'll, I'll go out with all the best intentions of shooting the biggest stag and suddenly you walk out and I go, oh, you look tasty. And I'll just, <laughs> that's, that's it and I'll take that and I'll be home. Um, but, yeah, so I, I do eat hair quite a lot um, and I will go out and target them um, quite a bit. Uh, most of the time, if I go out where I really want to target them, I'll go out of a night time, mm-hmm. go back to my my um, old ways of uh, of. Uh, you know, doing it, but I, I do do it completely legal on a private property. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, I suppose there's just, I don't know. It's just so many different, I think this year I want to try to get, um, that was the one thing that COVID did um, spoil for me in the, in the regards to the book was um, I didn't actually get to do buff, which is what I wanted mm. to do for the book. Yeah. Um, and also camel, but everything else in the book I've actually hunted and harvested. Wow, um, camel, cool. I actually went and spoke to a few friends that have done it quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And I spoke with them about it. Um, uh, buff, I've actually home killed a lot, a lot of beasts and I've yeah, wow. eaten buff and I've, I've accessed buff and eaten it and used it, but I just actually haven't been there in front of it. I tried to actually get on to um, uh, a couple times to get up there to do it, but in between photographers, COVID, the whole thing, just Mm -hmm. couldn't end up pulling it up and it it never went. Um, And now if I do do a buff, I I don't know why. I just, I really want to get up close and personal. So I definitely Definitely. want to do it with a bow. How good. Yeah. Not a bad thing to have happen. Yeah. I was it before COVID happened. That year was, um, it was on my 50th and I planned to do uh, a hunt, which I was going to be going out in um, Canada somewhere. And it was going to be a double tag and it was moose and elk. Mm. And I've always wanted to eat moose as yeah. my, you know, moose is my thing. Um, and um, so I was going to shoot moose with a gun because I was not going to not leave without it. Yeah. And then the elk, I was going to do the elk with a bow. So, I mean, like I kind of have walked those finer lines of, of both types of, um, you know, hunting, but um I think just the couple of hiccups that I've had in my my bow hunting career of um, that samba, which I hit, that made me stop for a while, uh-huh. and then um and then after that I went okay and reassessed it and then went in and and got a really good setup. Went and saw Brad Murphy. He sorted me, you know, and just started doing everything properly again. And I've been really confident with it. And now mm. I've been slapped in the eye. I'm, it's not going to hold me back. I'm going to actually good. You're I'm getting gonna, tested. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. It is. You know, and. And then I'll, it's just like, it was shooting so well before that, that I was just so hyped about great. I'm actually, it was the most confident I've actually felt with it. Yeah. And I was just like, man, you know, this, this rut stuff's going, you know, I was like, <laughs> it's gonna I, happen. I, I was already tasting the venison so you could speak. And um, <laughs> yeah. And even the Mr. Wonky was probably still laughing at me now with them. Um, he said, "What was that guy that's wheeling about over the? Looking with his black eye. Yeah, yeah, over the pond there. Yeah, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, in regards to, to wild pork, and I know you kind of touched on it, like the not taking the the offal as such. Something I always do is check the offal before I take it. But yeah, your your thoughts on on wild pork in general? Um, typically pretty safe. Is there a, a main sort of system that you should do before you go and eat it? Well, I think with mild, I mean." 
you know, some people say freeze it, you know, mm-hmm. it kills all parasites, bacteria, yeah. which, you know, that will, but as soon as you bring that out, if you're going to leave that out to defrost, they'll start multiplying again if there's wow. anything in there. Yeah, so, so that's if they're still left in there. I just personally, you know, think with wild pork, you try to cook it as much as you can. You know, don't serve it mm-hmm. rare. No, you yes. know, even though even though the old traditional dishes and everything that they've got, um, sorry, the old traditional um thing of saying pork, you know, has to be well cooked. And nowadays you can actually serve cooked um farm pork, you know, medium rare, medium or whatever. Wow. Um, because uh they, you know, they got rid of all those diseases. Um after running pigs for nine years, mm-hmm. um doing a lot of slaughtering of pigs myself, um, you know, they digestive systems what they've got set up you know they're probably the most closest to a human you know they've got a lot of stuff going on there so Mm -hmm. you know it's one of those things it's like with any type of animal welfare you know if the animal's in good condition and the meat's in good condition you know you're usually pretty fine yeah but you know the thing is i was like with pork you know um they can hold worms for oh geez quite a while before they you know start becoming pretty bad we had bad roundworm on my place that i'd have to do them probably every three months wow. yeah and and you know um so it's it's one of those things and i mean and they'd still you know still hold condition but they just wouldn't get any further and then mm. you'd worm them in it, and then everyone would just go grow quicker um but i was running old breeds as well which is kind of similar to like a lot of the australian wild pork is the black pig mm-hmm. um but um i actually got given one the other day someone sent me a photo and said, do you want this pig? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks. And I was like, you know, so, uh, cause up here, they're quite rare. There are a few spots yeah, okay. of them, but um, yep. yeah, no. And she was a, she's a great little, great little sow. She's about, you know, to, I wouldn't say she was even a sow. She'd probably even like a little pork. She's like, you know, 25, 30 kilo, just yeah. really nice. Yeah. That's, that's to be typical. Like, oh, sorry, to be honest, that's typically the size I would try to shoot is like a little 30, 40 kilo yep. pig instead get them while they're young, check mm. the organs, freeze yep. it still anyway. And then I always make sure they're just cooking it really good. Yep. Um, and to be honest, they're, they're some of the best eating meat they've had, like they're incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, I was like, you know, you will, you know, if, if you're doing those things and just following those basic rules, you mm-hmm. know, you, you should be pretty safe. Cause I have heard of people saying, Oh, you know, they've got worms in them. And I'm like, well, majority of pork only gets worms in the internals. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't actually transfer through the flesh. Um, I have seen it in kangaroos and yep. wallabies, but I've never seen it in pigs. Mm-hmm. So, and so that's why I find, you know, but the thing is, I was like, if you've got something, you know, it's backbones showing exactly. the, the loins of trunk in, you know, it's not in good, you know, you don't really, because that's been running on its own adrenaline. It's been mm-hmm. running on its own. You know, it's been eating itself away. It's been wasting away. Exactly. So you probably find there's going to be something not right within that animal, you know, and that's the same as like, you know, occasionally I've done, I think there's probably only been a, a few deer that I've just not eaten um, and, you know, not taken the whole lot of it or even a bit. A couple of those were actually just a bit of a mistake with the 300 rum. So there wasn't much left of them. But um, uh, just in general, I mean, you know, uh, pigs, you know, I think I think pigs in Australia. It's like I haven't shot them up in the north where I hear a lot of this. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things. Until you know it, or until you're there, you know, you don't really know it. Definitely, yeah. And I mean, I'm not necessarily going out and into the Cape or anything like that and shooting pigs and eating them. So <laughs> I think it's very different. I think you got to pick yeah, your areas. But those, those pigs are all sitting around in swamps, and they're going to be rolling around in mud, and they're going to be scuzzy, scuzzy <laughs> the stuff. I not mean, the ones you want. Yeah. You, you know, it's just like you know that, that, that you, you know exactly what condition they're going to look like when they come out. They're going to be covered in crap. <laughs> oh, they would be. Yeah, uh, definitely. Well, yeah. Ross, it's been awesome. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure we could probably talk for another hour, but I'm going to be uh, respectful of your time. And let's just yep. maybe send people where where are the best places to go and get their hands on wild meat. Look, um, at the moment, it's lucky enough, it's um, pretty much everywhere. So if you just Google it online, Wild Meat Book, um, it'll come up. Uh, any type of distributor, Dimix, uh, Amazon, online, all of them have them. Um, I sell copies direct, which I'd signed, and I sell them at the same price that you can buy them online for, uh, posted. But, um, you know, and, and that's the other thing too. Uh, with this day and age, um, you know, I'm always open, man, as well. If anyone's got any questions or anything, come in. 
you know, it's like, you know, how kind of like we started talking and yeah, just and just with other stuff, I, I find, you know, even like courses and stuff like that we've done and just catching up with people, you know, it's just like the more people that are approachable, I mean, you know, if, if it wasn't people weren't like that for me, I wouldn't have got to where I got, you know, mm-hmm. with bow hunting or hunting in general. And so, you know, it's one of those things, you know, you've got to give back to what you've been given. So doors always okay. open, man. Yeah, that's incredible. Where, what uh, You said some of the courses you're doing. Is there any coming up that you've got going on? Um, I don't think any at the moment. I'm looking at putting a couple more on. Um, the ones that I was doing with Brad and Robert Herbert, uh-huh. they were the ones, the Bohoning ones. Yeah. Um, we're looking at trying to get a couple more up. Um, and then I was looking at doing some straight up just meat ones where I will just do like pretty much what's in the book. So with the book, I haven't really gone into hunting. It's pretty much walking up to the animal when it's there yes so yeah. i want to do a few workshops of okay that's what's written in the book this is it impractical because i'm one of those people do you can give me a book i'm not going to fucking read it <laughs> but you show me three times over and i go oh you know, show me and i go oh that's great yeah you know, I'm, I'm actually a very practical hands-on person um so i'm thinking i'm trying to start a couple of those up at the moment i'm just trying to organize uh, a venue for it around yeah, in the area, which which would be able to work out so and so you'll be advertising that through your socials when you get there yeah pretty much just yeah. through the socials i don't i don't use much uh facebook at all but i am on there um mm-hmm. i just kind of try to keep that just for um when, when i traveled in the 90s we didn't have email and and internet so most of my mates which i met overseas are all i've reconnected back through there so yeah that's why i've always kept that open but um i'm reasonably i'm probably active on instagram i do look at it a lot but i'm yeah. not a massive contributor so to say um it's you know, reasonably I, active sorry it's reasonably active. You've got a bit, bit going yeah. on there. Oh, yeah. It, it has been since the book's been out. Before yeah. that, probably not. Um, probably the stories. I'll always um, uh, I'll always post my hunts, but pretty much usually just the, the start of the day mm-hmm. or a part of the day, and, and that's it. And so, like I said, you know, I'm getting out there, and, and that's what I normally post So because I like to get out and about a bit. Um, but, yeah, yeah, probably uh, Instagram, probably the main one. That's awesome. Well, yeah. So for people to follow along there, it's underscore Ross O'Mara, which is R O S S O M E A R A. You can find him there and I'll check that all in the show notes, of course, as well. So Ross, thank you. heaps, mate. This has been great. It's been absolute ball. No worries, buddy. Thanks. It's been awesome.